Uh, my name is David Kramer. I'm VP of Product Management here at CA in the App Delivery Business Unit. And as you can see, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the cool kids are doing in CD. And really, what I'm going to talk about today is there's a lot of um, misinformation about different tools, open source tools. When should I use them? How should I use them? Different types of deployments that some of the more advanced customers are using. So really, I just want this session to be informative. Um, if you guys have questions, please feel free to ask questions as we go, or we'll have some time at the end as well. Um, and again, I'm really just going to outline some of the best practices that we're seeing from some of the industry leading companies who are doing continuous delivery. So let's get started. Um, you can see we've got a little agenda here. We'll talk about some of the challenges these companies face. We'll talk about the links in the chain. Um, and what we mean by that is there are actually a lot of different tools that customers are using when they start to try and take on this, you know, this philosophy or this approach known as continuous delivery. So we'll talk a little bit about those tools and some of the options and, you know, because some of those tools you can actually use to do multiple things. And in some cases, there's a little misconception about what you might be able to do with without these tools. Then we'll talk about how you orchestrate the release process so that you can take on some of these more advanced deployment styles. You know, things like canary deployments or red-green deployments or, you know, dark deployments. These are popular with the web forward and web scale IT shops. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how you can take advantage of those techniques. And then we'll pull it all together at the end. So first thing, great quote from Gartner. I think this is, um, you know, just the, the life that most people in IT have lived for a long time. This notion of, of DevOps or continuous delivery, I, I, I talk in just about every session about a culture of shared ownership. Because I think one of the most important things that customers have to recognize is that if your teams aren't actually all on the same page and working to a common goal, you're going to have problems. And Gartner says that about 80% of all the mission critical IT outages result from people and process failures. And you can see down below, and more than 50% of those are the coordination failures around the environments, the releases, and the configuration. And I've always joked that, you know, when I think of dev and ops, and I talk to customers about, well, where do dev and ops meet? More often than not, they point at the environments. And we all know what the dev people say. Well, it worked on my box, so it must be the environment's problem. And we all know what the ops people say. The ops guys say, hey, you threw code over the fence with no instructions, no information. So you threw crappy code over, and I'm having a struggle with it. And what you really see here is just a lack of coordination. They lack visibility. They lack shared information. And in a lot of cases, they have kind of a myopic view. They're looking at their step in the tool chain, and they don't really care what happens down the road. So let's talk a little bit about how we can fix some of these failures that we see. So I talk about this slide a lot when I present because I think that one of the big challenges that people don't recognize at first is that what you really need to do is build out a tool chain. Anyone who's listened to me talk, I always say you cannot go back to your dev and your test and your IT operations team and tell them that the answer is rip out all your tools, put in something new, and it'll solve all your problems. A, that something new doesn't exist. B, those teams will actually look at you a little bit funny and say, you don't know enough about the process we're following because I can't get rid of these tools. There's a reason we're using these tools. So the challenge that you've got here is geographically dispersed teams, lots of different tool sets. You have different processes that are designed to do the same thing. And so you end up with a real, real problem because what started out as maybe a project to automate the release, I want to take this package of software and deploy it over here, turns into an integration and people process nightmare. And then it's confounded by the fact that we're all trying to go faster. Shorter release cycles, more releases coming out the door. So when you're building this tool chain and you're actually thinking about, well, how do the people who are doing this in the web scale world, how do the people who kind of pioneered continuous delivery, what, what approaches do they take? What tools do they use? And maybe most importantly, how do they use those tools? Because as I said before, you can do a lot of things with different software packages. Some of them are purpose built. Some of them are generic platforms. So one of the things that we see a lot is we'll hear people, and typically this comes from the developer world, oh, we've already automated the release. And I say, well, how did you do that? And they say, well, we have Jenkins, we wrote a script, it grabs the latest build, and it deploys it into an environment. And I say, that's great, you've automated one step in the release process. Talk to me about what comes next. What do you mean what comes next? I, I have a script, it grabs it from Jenkins and it deploys it. Well, wait a minute, doesn't somebody test the software after you're done? Oh yeah, but that's the test team. They're, they, they're in a different building, I don't care about them. And so you end up seeing 
a whole bunch of people who think that they can maybe get by just using a CI tool like TFS or Jenkins or Team City. Now these are great tools and we recommend that all of our customers have a lot of maturity around the build and continuous integration process because that's one of the key pieces to getting this continuous delivery flow right. But what we don't recommend is that you try and extend those CI tools into areas where maybe they're not intended. And so you can script the heck out of your Jenkins system to do some deployments, but at the end, if we go back to the orchestration and the collaboration piece, you're gonna fail because you're really solving maybe one-tenth or one-fifth of that problem and not really helping your test, your integration, the acceptance, and maybe the production guys downstream from you. Another real popular thing, and this one I get a lot, doesn't continuous delivery equal Chef? I mean, that's what all the cool kids are doing, right? You put your app in Amazon, you use Chef, and wham, continuous delivery, you're going. Well, those infrastructure provisioning and config management tools like Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Salt, CF Engine, there's numerous others, they actually have capabilities that can deploy software packages. They can do some of the basic release things, but again, you get into that problem where now I've got architects who are supposed to be defining the standards for my environment, defining how those environments should be configured, and really focusing on making sure that part of the equation is right. Now you have them writing code or scripting to try and stitch things together. And so if you haven't uh, seen, we have a really strong integration with a lot of the open source tools around this very topic, infrastructure and config. And then another one is the release tools themselves. So I cannot tell you how many times customers come to me and say, well, can I use your release tool to provision my environment? I need to spin up virtual machines. I need to install software on those machines. And yeah, maybe you could use our release tool to do that, but I wouldn't suggest it because we didn't design it for that. So a lot of the things that the people who have pioneered this space are focusing on is not just the end-to-end -end automation or the process, but making sure that they've got the right tools in place for the right job they're trying to do. So let's look at an example of kind of continuous integration. Right? This is a, a pretty common best practice for achieving continuous delivery. Your developers are checking code in. They check code in several times a day. Now, a lot of companies still have the traditional nightly build process. You know, the developers work, everybody checks things in, then at some point in the evening, it all gets combined together and we get a nightly build. We get a release candidate that we want to push out. But more and more, one of the things we're seeing really advanced customers do is they create a release after every check-in. So we have companies that are doing 2,500, 3,000 deployments a day because they've got all their teams checking code in and they are actively creating new builds, bringing those builds through into a development and a test process to improve the speed and the quality. What you really see here is you're able to detect problems earlier in the cycle and you can do a little bit less backtracking because you're using some of these tools that are around continuous integration. But again, one of the key messages is, look at what we highlighted down here. This is where you've got your build and your CI systems, and this is a lot of the times where artifacts come into play, and you wanna use an artifact repository so that you can version all the artifacts that you're gonna deploy. Another common problem that we see with customers is, where do you store those artifacts? Well, they're on a local file share, or I put them on this server, or maybe you know I put them over there, and there's no versioning, and it becomes real problematic as you try to deploy software, because not only that release candidate needs, needs to get deployed, but also your artifact packages have to be deployed. And if you're not versioning those, then you miss out on traceability all the way through the process. You're not able to say what version of the package, what version of the artifact was deployed into the environment, and did that change over time, or was that consistent? So we see a lot of companies who are focusing on continuous integration, and one of the great things here is that most of these tools are open source tools. And so we've seen a lot of adoption from the developer community, and even some from the IT operations community, to grab these tools and really streamline the front end of the continuous delivery process. Let's move to config management. I talked a little bit about Chef earlier, Puppet as well. Um, we did a recent study, and you can see that 49% of the people that we talk to actually use tools like Puppet, Chef, CF Engine, Ansible, and Salt to do config management. They take a new approach to config management. Some call it a declarative approach. You know, in the past, a lot of the configuration stuff was done via discovery. 
go discover the environment, tell me about all the configurations, then compare it all. And those tools really never worked because it was hard to identify what changed that mattered. It was easy to identify a thousand things that were different, but what was it that mattered? So these new tools take an approach where you declare the state you want the environment in, and then the system basically makes a promise that it will either have the environment in that state, or it will tell you that the environment is not in that state. So we've done an integration so that we can show those environment changes so our customers can get full stack visibility. They can see the packages that were deployed and the differences there, and they can see the environment, that stack change. Maybe somebody patched something, or maybe somebody overrode a library unintentionally when they were installing something. So it's really important to see those configuration changes and track those changes as part of your release process. One of the interesting things is that 73% of the people still use scripts for a lot of the infrastructure changes. We actually think that's a pretty bad practice because unfortunately, nothing wrong with scripts themselves, but it's the downstream effects of scripts. Your smart people have to maintain those scripts. When those smart people leave the company, you have to have new smart people figure out what the heck those scripts do and how to continue to maintain them. So we push a lot of our customers towards this new approach to infrastructure automation and config management. However, as I said earlier, and if you've gone up to the Amazon show up at the, where is it, at the Venetian, you'll see that Chef is the keynote for DevOps up there. They're the, the key company, they're talking nonstop about DevOps, and a lot of people up there think that they can use Chef to do release planning or release orchestration or even release automation, right? The Chef guys would tell you, yeah, if you've got a bunch of smart programmers and you want to go have at it, you can use the tool to do it, but that's not really what we designed it for. So again, another case where if you look at the best practices, well, if you look at the best practices, you'll see that a lot of the leading companies are taking an approach where they use declarative tools for configuration and they use these same tools to do infrastructure provisioning and infrastructure automation. And here's a, a quick summary of where those things fit into the flow. So IT automation, hey, I need a, a great example. I need a new Tomcat server so that I can deploy my application and test it. Well, that Tomcat server needs to be configured a certain way. So one of the things that we've seen a lot of customers doing is they'll build a, a chef recipe or a puppet module or the, an Ansible playbook. They'll have a little different term for what they call them, but basically they'll build the design. The architect will build the design for how they want that Tomcat server to be configured or even that whole application environment to be configured. And then you reuse that recipe as a part of your release process so that anytime you need a new system, you can reference that, call down to that system and deploy it or if you just need to make a configuration change on an existing system so that it matches a given blueprint or recipe or playbook, whatever they're called, you can do that as well. And then as I said earlier, one of the big benefits is you actually can bring the stack information and the application information together so that when you do have a performance issue or you do have a problem with a release, it's not as difficult to figure out what changed, who changed it, and maybe where that problem is. Um, and again, the reduced risk of failure. One of the key use cases that all of the leading edge companies do is config validation pre and post checks. Right before they deploy, they check the environment. They understand exactly how it's configured and they identify if there's a problem before the deployment. Then right after the deployment, they check the environment again. And they identify, did the things we expected to change change? Was there anything out of the ordinary that changed? Just a simple best practice that we've seen from those leading edge companies who are actually doing continuous delivery at large scale today. Testing and automated testing. This is, some would argue, the key bottleneck in application delivery. I maybe would agree with them. I think there's a lot of bottlenecks depending on where you are in the life cycle of the maturity curve, but the testing problems are, are pervasive because it becomes very, very difficult when you don't have enough test automation, when you're having to stand up testing environments either manually or handcraft those environments, um, and maybe most importantly is you actually don't have good test data in those environments. So you end up with test results that don't actually mimic the real world. 
hey, I tested it and didn't have any problems. Yeah, but you know what? The production environment has clustering, has load balancers, has a very different look and feel than the environment you tested in. Or, hey, I tested and everything was great, but you know what? The data, the test data that you used, the actual system data was unrealistic. And so the test results aren't valid because you didn't have good data. Now, test data management is a big problem, but it's one of the things that a lot of the leading companies are beginning to address because they recognize if they can take a data set clean it up, you know, take all the sensitive information out of it, and then reuse those real world data sets as you go through these testing processes, you get a lot better test results and a lot more value. And similarly, if you can get test automation and test environments predefined and deployed as a part of the process, again, another best practice that actually speeds up this part of the process. Some of the most advanced customers we have will actually either spin up or reconfigure the environment, we'll deploy the application, and then in some cases we'll trigger the test to run so that your QA team or your test team doesn't actually have to do anything until the results begin to come in. Hey, it looks like the tests are failing, let's go look and see the issues and start work working with our dev team to fix these problems. Or, hey, look at that, we passed all the tests, it's time to promote the app to the next stage. So that's a little bit more of an advanced use case, but a real time saver and value saver because if you think about your testing teams, they spend a lot of time setting up environments, configuring environments, and writing test automation. And CA has a lot of good solutions in this space. So when we get back to this notion of orchestrating the tool chain, I have a couple of examples here because one of the things that all of the companies that are doing this, whether they're using CA or competing products or they've built their own stuff, they'll all tell you that the key to this is you want reusability in your processes. You do not want to automate a release process for every release, every team, every application, and every environment. You end up spending all your time building out the automation routines and you don't really get any value because each of those routines gets used once a month or once a year. So one of the things that we see a ton of value coming from is this idea of reuse. And so let's talk about a couple of examples here and see how this works in the real world. Because if any of you have talked to me, you've heard me say, I do not believe that there is a one size fits all approach. Different teams, different tools, there's a reason. These applications are not simple, they're complicated. So let's look at a couple of examples here. So here's one where phase one of the release process, you can see they've got Jenkins and Nexus for their CI and their artifact repository. In this case, VMware. So they're probably going to a private cloud and maybe provisioning a new system for doing this unit test. And then from a configuration perspective, they're using Chef. They've got some recipes that say, this is how I want that environment to be used. Then when we actually get over to the testing side, well, they've got one of our competitor's tools there, and they want to trigger the tools to run those tests so that they can get to that next phase, because really what you're trying to do here is get an automated promotion routine. I want to be able to automate from this phase to the next phase, but the key here is you've got a mix of four or five different tools that you have to integrate into this process in order to make your dev team accept this process or make your testing, your IT operations team accept this process because they won't accept it if you come back and say, I can deliver this automation, however, you've got to get a new CI, a new testing suite, and oh, by the way, you need a new environment or configuration system. They're gonna say no, because it doesn't make sense. So now let's move forward. Here's phase 1B, little different nuance. You'll notice that this is a Microsoft app because you can see that instead of Jenkins, they're using Team Foundation as their CI, and they're actually using Artifactory from JFrog as their repository. In this case, they're not provisioning to a private cloud, they're provisioning to Azure, a public cloud environment. So obviously the steps are a little bit similar in I want to grab my build, I want to grab my artifact packages, I want to set my environment up and provision them, but the actual details are very, very different. Different tools, different environments. You can see we put Puppet in here, so instead of Chef, you're using Puppet for the config, and then over here you're using CA and CA's cloud test tool for doing performance testing. And again, the goal is to get to this promotion. You want to be able to automatically promote. Now you could have 99% similar steps in the process, but the tooling is different. 
You could also have a few changes in the process itself because the application or the environment is different. But the goal here is to reuse as much of that release process so that you get consistent results, so that you can do the automated change tracking, but provide the flexibility for the teams to be able to use the tools that they need to use to get the job done. So this is a kind of another example of unit test. Now let's go into an acceptance environment. We're back to Nexus, Jenkins, VMware on the front end. You can see we added something down here. Hey, in this environment, we're actually using CA's service virtualization technology because maybe there were some constrained systems that we didn't have access to. Maybe we needed to test some APIs that the developers hadn't quite finished writing against. So in this case, very similar flow, but we've added a new layer of complexity because we want to speed this up. We don't want the teams to have to wait around for the APIs to get finished or maybe that expensive constrained system to become available. Right? Most customers, when they do this, they end up having to wait for late night maintenance windows or they have to do things serial. So they, they wait for one team to finish. Okay, now that they finished, I can start testing my code. And that's a slow way to do things. So just another quick example that shows how you can plug different things in. In that case, it was virtual services. Now here in this case, let's say we're ready to go to production. So we've got Jenkins on the front end, Nexus for our artifacts, VMware for the environment, Chef for the configuration. Same exact thing. But notice what we have over here at the end. Right before we go to promotion, we've got to reach out to our service desk because at my company, there's an approval process that has to happen before we can go into production. And so we automatically route over to ServiceNow, and that could say Remedy, and that could say CA Cloud Service Manager, and that could say, you know, the number of different service desk technologies we support. The point is that they're pluggable, but that you can build a single release process around how you want to go out and get that approval gate done, and then reuse it across all your different teams at the right moment in the testing phase when you're getting ready to promote, say, to production. Now, some companies have approval gates at each phase. You need an approval to go from dev to test or test to staging. We added one more wrinkle in here that's pretty interesting. Down at the bottom, you can see the F5 logo. So as you move from the not as real world environments that you normally see in the dev test, in dev test world over to the real world production environments, one of the really common things we see is load balancers. They don't exist in the earlier phases, the lower stages of the release cycle, but they certainly exist in most production environments because they're a necessary part of how you manage the application. So now I've got a release process that's basically the exact same, but at the very end, I've got to go make some load balancer configurations so that this application can actually run correctly in my production environment. So just yet another example of how some of the more advanced customers are taking a similar release flow, reusing that flow across different teams, different phases of the environment, and using different tools along the way because again, a lot of the time those tools are necessary, the developers or testers chose them for a reason. So let's wrap up. I think I've got another minute or two and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, let's build it out. So you know, one of the first things that I like to point at is most customers when they think about automating a release, they'll say things like, oh, that's pretty easy, I think we can do it, you know, a couple of scripts, we'll have a CI system. And I like to point out that as you look at this automation problem, one of the challenges you're gonna have is you're gonna have to integrate, probably not to all of these tools, but certainly to some subset of these tools. Most companies have multiple artifact repositories. Most companies have multiple build or CI systems. Maybe on the provisioning and config side, the environment's a little more static, so you only have one or maybe two tools there. Certainly lots of testing tools get involved, and certainly you could have lots of service management type tools for you know, promotion, for approvals, maybe even updating a CMDB. So it's very, very challenging for a company who thinks that they can just script the release and automate the flow to kind of wake up to the fact that, hey, now I actually have to build integrations to 5, 10, 15, 20 tools. I have to maintain those integrations. I also have to build integrations to the components I'm going to deploy to, the app servers, the database servers, the load balancers I might need to change, the other middleware components that might be required for your application. So integrating into this ecosystem is a real big challenge. And it's one of the things that CA does pretty well. We've got 125 out-of-the-box integrations for release automation today. And we release new integrations every month. So um, we've been doing this for about the last 11 months. And we average about four or five new integrations or improvements to existing integrations every single month. 
So this is an area where we're adding a whole lot of value, and a lot of our customers are looking at us and saying, wow, this is a burden that we don't want to have to manage. Thank you for managing it. So let's talk about one customer. This is one of my favorite stories. Um, I mean, obviously, they're one of our customers, so I love it for that reason, and it's a great success story. But I actually just love the story itself. It's very, very cool. So for those that don't know Tesco, it's a, a grocer based in the UK. And Tesco has been expanding. They're doing very well, and they've been expanding around the world. Well, as a, a retailer, as a grocery store, one of their challenges was space. As they started to move into Asia Pack, they ran into huge problems with the cost of the actual real estate. In order to get the good real estate near where the people live and where they would shop, Tesco was going to have to pay top, top dollar, and it was actually going to break their financial model. They weren't going to be able to make the money they thought they could make because the real estate was going to be so expensive. So what did they do? It's a little hard to see in this picture, but that's actually a train station. And you can see the people getting on the train. And you see the gentleman here at the front, he's got his smartphone up, and he's actually waving it across an interactive billboard that they've designed. He's ordering groceries from his phone at the train station. So this is an application. It's designed to look like the, the shelf at the supermarket, you know, the produce section or the meat section, or in this case, it looks like he's you know, buying some juice or a beverage or something. Um, but really, really interesting technology, really cool example of what we call the application economy. This is a company that wanted to expand into Asia Pac, ran into some real financial hurdles, and came up with an innovative solution that was based on software. So you can see what happened here. First of all, they were able to penetrate new markets and create a new opportunity for customers to interact with them. I mean, I'd love to have this. Not because I'm you know, always traveling or whatnot, but because I have three young children, and there's nothing worse than taking three young children to the grocery store. It takes about three hours to buy groceries when you got young kids, because they run crazy, they throw stuff in the bag. I'd love to be able to scan my phone, buy stuff, and then get home and have it shipped to me. Unfortunately, Tesco hasn't rolled it out in Austin, Texas, where I live, um, but they are trialing it in, I think, three different cities in Asia right now. Just a really, really cool story. And one of the, oh, look at that, it's deployed into eight different countries, not three. Um, but one of the real values here is that this team kind of caught fire. They got really excited, and of course, all the executives wanted them to go faster, and so that was the impetus for working with CA. They actually looked at us and said, wow, you guys can help us go faster, and we really need to keep this application up to date. Because you can imagine how often the grocery store shelves change. They're trying to mimic that behavior. New products, new prices, new promotions, coupons, but they're trying to mimic it in a virtual store that they've placed out on these billboards. So really, really interesting story. And I thought that was a great example of kind of what some of the cooler kids are doing with DevOps. So at this time, questions from the audience? Any comments, questions? All right, great. Well, I appreciate the time today. Thanks.